Okay, um, so this is a joint uh, paper with uh, Andrea Ziegler and Giorgia Romagnoli. Uh, both of them are present here. Uh, but I want to say one short thing about Andreas. I think Andreas is a very talented PhD student who will be on the market next year. And uh, I would be super happy to hire him if, if I were not my own university because we're not allowed to hire our own people. Okay, let's uh, continue and go into the talk. So what we do in this project is we contribute to the debate which is exists in the social sciences about whether markets erode morals. And of course, uh, uh, this question attracted a lot of attention from social philosophers in the last 300 years. Uh, very interestingly, in my view, the, in the last decade, this, this debate was actually guided by data. And, and in my view, that's the way it should be. And I think that the paper that uh, deserves praise here is the one by Falk and Zech, who started an experimental literature on this. And what they did was they had an approach in which they asked the question whether subjects care less about causing a negative externality when trading in a market compared to individual decision making. Right. And I think that it's fair to say that, that all follow up uh, work, in, including our project, makes use of the same uh, technology. Um, so let me remind you of the key finding of Falkenseg. So the key finding is that 46% uh, of people kill a mouse for 10 euros in individual decision making, whereas 76% uh, of the people do so in markets. And then um, um, Falkenseg studied that question in single unit markets. And that means that every trader is limited to trading one unit at most. And all the follow-up papers uh, started from the same setup on single unit markets. Right, so there's some inter very interesting work that uh, considered the effects of sorting, anonymity, shared guilt, market framing, and social learning in their setup. And, and, and many of these variables had effects and some did not, um, but there was quite some, uh, some follow-up here. More recently, uh, their fake findings were also challenged. And uh, so one, one challenge was from a, a paper by Buffling, Fear and Özdemir, who uh, pointed at a feature of the Falk and Zeg um, setup and argued that what Falk and Zeg did was, was very two things at the same time, uh, repeated decision-making versus uh, a market and, and the market versus individual decision-making. Right. And what they did was they, they uh, looked at the effect of a market when controlling for repetition. And quite surprisingly, they, they, in their study, did not find evidence that the market per se affects people's morals, uh, but that it's repeated decision making that does it. Another paper that was uh, uh, critical about the Falcon Sech study is a paper by uh, Zutter, Huber, Huber Kirchler, Stefan, and Walzer, uh, published in 2020. And they looked at the, what, what was considered in their paper, an unbalance in the proportion of sellers. Uh, so in the setup of uh, Falk and Zeg, uh, there were more sellers than buyers. And, and, and uh, Sutta et al. suggest, have data that suggest that, the dis, that it is this unbalance that, that uh, causes decreasing prices uh, in, in the market. So like I already said, um, I think all these people, all, all these papers share the feature that they started from single unit markets. And I think this is important because in single unit markets, traders have some market power, right? So in single unit markets, there will always be one side of the market that at least one side of the market that will be able to affect aggregate outcomes. And in our view, this is, this is a feature that is not representative of most uh, markets in the real world. So in our view, many markets which are characterized by negative externalities are better characterized as multi-unit markets in which traders do not have the power to affect aggregate outcomes. 
So examples of uh, such markets would be the airline industry, the market for weapons trading, and the market for opioids. And um, I think this is important because multi-unit markets allow for excuses that are not available in single unit markets. And let me, let me focus here on, on the market for opioids. So as you may know, uh, recently this was a scandal, in, especially in the US. So opioids are very strong painkillers like oxycodone. And in the last uh, 20 years, many people in the US died from overdosing from these painkillers. And uh, so, so the, the problem is that these painkillers are super addictive and that you can easily make a mistake, or if you make a mistake, it can easily kill you, right? So having one or two painkillers too many can kill a person. And in 2017, the number of people dying from an overdose of op op opioids in the US was almost 50,000 people, and it surpassed the people dying from car accidents. Right? So, so, so Naturally, this market had some uh, pushback. And then here's a quote from a spokeswoman of McKesson. And McKesson was the largest distributor of op opioids in the period uh, from 2006 to 2012 in the US. And she said, any suggestion that McKesson influenced the volume of opioids prescribed or consumed in this country would reflect a misunderstanding of our role as a distributor. Right. So even though McKesson was the, the most active player in this market, they clearly had the feeling that they were not affecting aggregate outcomes. And if they would not have distributed the, the, these opioids, somebody, somebody else would have done it. Right. So what we are going to do in this uh, paper is we're going to compare single unit markets with multi-unit markets. And we think that two factors in particular can contribute to multi-unit markets producing less moral outcomes. And the first factor is uh, uh, what uh, we call market selection. And the idea here is that in a multi-unit market, the price and the quantity will be set by the least moral trader. Right? So you can easily imagine that if people have heterogeneous preferences, and on either side of the market, uh, the, the, the least moral trader is going to be the most active trader, that then the, the, the aggregate outcome will not be reflective of the medium preference in the market, but uh, much more will be traded then, right? So this would be one uh, channel through which market selection could play a role. Another channel is what we call the desensitization, desensitization effect. And here the idea is that uh, it could be that especially when people start trading, they feel very reluctant. But once they've traded once, they have to, they can no longer maintain this uh, super moral self-image that they might have at the start. And this may decrease their marginal moral cost for later units. But right? so it could also be that if, if you have a market where you can, can trade many units, once you start trading, you think, okay, let's now go ahead and uh, make as much money as possible. So these will be uh, market selection effects. Uh, so it's then not the case that people's preferences or morals uh, are affected by market trading per se, but it's more the case that the market weighs, weighs the, the, the preferences of people differently, right? And, and, and the preferences of immoral people become overweighted. A second, um, a second channel would be the replacement logic. And in the replacement logic, uh, people trade because they feel that otherwise somebody else would be taking advantage of the trading opportunity, right? And this was already alluded to by this quote from this uh, lady from McKesson. And, um, and naturally, I think it's very important to note here that both these effects, both market selection and replacement logic can not play or almost not play a role in single unit markets. Right? So in that sense, I, I think that 
so, so we have the feeling that this, this early uh, literature uh, missed some very important factors, and these factors will be the most important uh, uh, target of our study, although we will also contribute on some other questions. Uh, this is uh, the introduction, and I think it's maybe a good time to stop and see if there are questions so far. If not, yeah. So if, if, if there is no other question, then I will ask a question. Yes. Um, so um, the, the idea would also be a bit, I guess, that um, seeing those who trade uh, is somehow more salient in the market than seeing those who abstain from, from the trade, mm -hmm. I guess. Yeah. So that's, a, yeah. So social learning is another factor. And, and we, we, we had indeed this, uh, we also had this uh, conjecture that social learning may play a larger role in multi-unit markets than single unit markets. Um, so we're also going to shed light on this question, whether you know that the increased chances to learn from other people in a multi-unit market, whether that's going to deteriorate market outcomes. And you're very right in, in we, we had exactly your intuition that in a market, the, 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 the trading behavior of people that behave immorally is very visible, whereas the others who are acting very morally, you don't see them, right? So, so it may be a, an asymmetric effect of that. Yeah. yeah, I must say I also find that super plausible because when I look back into um, how people responded in our study in the aftermath, um, those who uh, traded in the markets, very often they said, um, yeah, you know, I saw others uh, were trading and making profit and why should I then not do that? Yeah. Um, of course, they could also see that not everybody is trading, right? So in a sense, you knew yeah. like, that, uh, yeah, <laughs> not everybody making the profit here, but uh, yeah. this did not show up in the answers. Yeah. I was wondering if you could say something about what constitutes moral or immoral because that does seem somewhat subjective. I mean, maybe killing a mouse for fun is not moral, but maybe if it's in my house, yeah, that's well, I, that's a different morality. So if you, or opioids, if I'm in a lot of pain, maybe one dose is okay, but I shouldn't be doing it every day. So I was wondering if you could expand on that a little bit. Yeah, no, so, so I, I agree with you, fully agree that, that morals is something, something subjective. So we're not going to have uh, uh, mice being killed, but we're going to use a method that is, uh, that we, uh, that is inspired by uh, the, the, the paper of Sutter et al. So we're going to look at uh, contributions uh, for a measles vaccine. And if people trade, they're going to cancel donations to UNICEF, which are about this measles vaccine. Right? Also, then you could ask the question, is this, is this something moral or is it something else? And I, I think, so my view on this is that, that the, the best people to answer is your subjects. Right? So, so what we did in, uh, in our experiment, we, at the end, we, we, we elicited people's views on the norms using this, uh, the Krupka Weber method. And we found there that uh, approximately al almost 90% of our subjects found the canceling of donations to UNICEF uh, as a trade for money, found that either somewhat immoral or very immoral. So our subjects view this trading as, as immoral and that's what we take as evidence that this is something about morality. Okay, thank you. Okay, if there's not more, then uh, I will continue with the design. So as I already said here, trading leads to a negative uh, externality and we use this uh, method of Sutra et al and trading cancels donations to UNICEF for measles vaccines. So, each trade cancels one unit of donation and one unit of donations is four doses of vaccine. And we explain to our subjects, the text which you can find on, on, on the webpage of UNICEF, which is that uh, it's actually super sad that uh, from a medical perspective, uh, uh, measles is solved, but from a practical perspective, it's not. So each kid can be vaccinated by having two doses of vaccine. And 
two doses of vaccine only cost 75 euro cents. So four doses of the vaccine then correspond to 1.5 euro. Having said that, it's super sad that still every year about 160,000 kids in this world die because they were not vaccinated against measles. Um, and we clearly explain this to our subjects that if they are going to trade, this is what's going to happen. Um, we are going to have four treatments between subject design. Uh, in this design, we have one treatment, which is individual decision making, where we elicit people's valuations for charity donations in multiple, multi unit, multiple price lists. And we do this repeatedly, right? So we do this repeatedly because of the possibility that was identified by the Bartling et al. paper that maybe if you do individual decision making repeatedly, maybe at some point people start even to uh, deteriorate their morals in that setup. Then we have a single uh, treatment where we use the single unit market, which is close to the Falcon Z market, but it differs in some aspect, which I will clarify uh, soon. Then we have a multi unit market, and the multi unit market is a scaled up version of the single unit market. And the idea behind the multi unit market is that uh, people have limited capacity constraints, which means that they are as pivotal for the aggregate outcome in relative terms as people are in the single market. But so in the multi market, we let people trade multiple units. But if they withdraw from trading a, a, a unit, nobody else can trade that unit. Then in the full market, we drop this limited capacity and then everybody can trade any unit that he wants. So this is the timeline of the experiment in all experiments. So also in the market treatments, we start with individual decision making because we want to also have some within measures. Then in periods two, three, four, and five, in the market treatments, people participate in markets. In the individual decision making treatment, we repeat individual decision making. Then in period six, they play again individual decision making. And then in seven and eight, we elicit people's beliefs and norms because we want to know some additional stuff about why they're trading in these markets. So here is uh, uh, the screenshot for the individual decision making uh, part. So it's maybe, I'm not sure that it's super easy to see, but what we did was we elicited people's values for canceling one, two, three, five, seven, 10 and 15 units. So here's the screen for seven units. So seven units corresponds to 28 doses of measles. And people here choose between either option A, which is money to themselves, or option B, which is 28 doses of measles vaccines for UNICEF. And the amount uh, uh, increases on the left-hand side. Right? So if you, if you value money as much for yourself, as much as money for UNICEF, then uh, 28 doses corresponds to 10 euro 50. So then you would uh, switch over at 10 euro 50 from the right hand side to the left hand side, and you would take money uh, at the bottom of the table. So in the market, we had fixed groups and roles. So each market had five sellers and five buyers. So we had a balanced number of traders. We had a sequential double auction. And let me briefly explain some features of a sequential double auction. So in the sequential double auction, at the start, one side of the market was selected randomly, and this side started trading. So say that the sellers started trading, then all sellers had 14 seconds to make an offer. At the end, the, the, the best offer was selected and offered to the other side. And people at the other side could then either accept the offer, the best offer, or make a counter offer. And if, if nobody accepted, then the best counter offer was, was, was presented to the other side. And this continued until either the unit was traded or both sides of the market didn't 
didn't uh, uh, submit improving offers, and then that unit would not be traded. Right? So each unit in the market, each potential unit was traded one by one using this method. Right? And I, I think so, so th this method has some advantages. One is that we get more information of all the traders in the markets. And I, I, another advantage is I think that this speeds up trading. And actually, so, so as you may notice, this is somewhat different from a regular double auction, but we also have before the, in the market periods, we had one practice period where they played for money, but where there was no negative externality. And when we use this market setup there, we see that in all uh, markets, they get to the competitive equilibrium, right? So, so in 100% of the cases. So from that perspective, this market produces uh, similar outcomes as a regular double auction. As I already said, we have varying capacity constraints of traders. So in the single uh, market, of course, people are are constrained by, by definition, but in the multi-unit markets, in one treatment, they were constrained, in the other, they were not. Cost of trading was one unit of donations canceled per trade, and the gains from trade were determined by induced costs and values, which used a common schedule. And this is also important to elaborate on, because what we mean with a common schedule is the following. So if you think about the traditional uh, double auctions of Plot and Smith, they use private schedules. So in a private schedule, it's the case that if I don't trade one of my units, nobody else can trade that unit, right? And, and we thought that this was not very representative of the markets that we wanted to study. So instead, we looked at a common schedule where if I don't trade as a seller, if I don't trade a particular unit, then somebody, then another seller can step in and trade that unit instead of me, right? So this is the, the market structure that we have in mind. And in this market structure, so the, the marginal costs and the marginal values that you're facing is not determined by the quantities that you traded so far, but it's determined by the quantities that were traded in the market so far. So here on the left-hand side, you see the single market. And on the right-hand side, you see the multi-unit markets. And they differ only in the, in the extent that every unit in the single market is tripled in the multi-market, multi-unit market. So another thing to notice here is that in the beginning, uh, in the beginning, the profit margin, the gains of trade are pretty large, right? So even if you care about the, the, the externality, you might still want to take the money because the money from the first unit is much more than the contribution to, to UNICEF. But if you look at the last unit, the last unit only has 20 cents gains of trade, right? which is much less than this 1.5 euro, which would go to UNICEF um, um, if people would refrain from trading. right? And that's the same is true for the last three units in the, in the multi-unit market. So here is a summary of our design. So if you compare individual decision-making treatment with single then you could look at the effects of market frame and shared guilt. If you compare single with multi, then we think that if there's a difference there, it should be attributed to improved chances of social learning in multi. If you compare multi with full, then you will find the aggregate effect of replacement logic and market selection. And we're going to, uh, Look, separate between the two by looking at the identity of the traders of the least profitable units. Right? So, so if everybody trades those units, then we're going to say that replacement logic plays a big, or replacement excuse plays a big role. If only people trade that are supposed to trade according to their individual preferences, uh, then it's, then it's um, market selection. I think this uh, is a good point for another break. So maybe if there's unclarity about the design, this would be a good moment to ask questions. And if everything is clear, then I will 
of course, gladly continue. Yes, so we had some questions in the chat, um, but okay. that was answered by Andrea. So that was about how many uh, units can be traded at most in, okay. in different uh, conditions. Yeah, so that's yeah. that's five in the single and fifteen in the in the multi. Yeah. And then we have one new question, Andreas. Do you maybe want to answer here? Maybe easier than by chat. Oh, um, so the question is about um, whether they can take the money basically from the experiment and donate it to the charity. They could in theory do that because we give them also the link, for example, such that they can verify that this donation opportunity is there and at what cost. But one important constraint there is that usually they get less money when they are canceling from UNICEF. So the, the units where we care about, they... They take basically, let's say, 50 cents for canceling 150. So this would not be a very, you know, smart strategy in, in terms of, uh, yeah, getting money to UNICEF, actually. Okay, thank you, Andreas. So if there's not more? I think that's all for now. For okay, then, then I'll go on and uh, present some results. So first we look at whether... Uh, uh, whether market selection can have an effect. And, 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 and to do that, we look at how people's, whether there's variation in our traders' preferences for the charity in their individual decision-making uh, part. So here you see uh, the number of subjects that value a 1.5 euro, euro donation to UNICEF, uh, a histogram of that. But on the left hand side, it's, uh, you see that there's quite a few people that, uh, that don't care much about UNICEF, that, that value it a little bit, but only a couple of uh, cents. In the middle, there's some people that almost, uh, or almost value it as much money for yourself as for UNICEF. And on the right hand side, there's also a spike at three which means that these are people that almost never want, never or almost never want to trade uh, money for a donation to UNICEF. Right? So, so notice that there's actually quite a few people that have a, have a value higher than 1.5, right? which means that the, these people really don't want to donate, uh, take money. They feel bad about taking money. Because indeed, they, they could have taken the money and then contributed to UNICEF themselves, and they prefer not to do that. Um, so the mean is uh, 1.70, right? So on, on average, people value 1.5 to UNICEF as, as 1.17 to themselves, right? But important takeaway from this slide is that there is quite some variety in how people value uh, uh, donations to UNICEF. So th this gives quite some scope to selection hypothesis. Another one is that uh, we look at, uh, at people's marginal cost curve. So we estimate a quadratic cost curve for each person. And this is, uh, this is what we get on average. And we see that people's uh, marginal costs decrease quite substantially. So on average, uh, there's a 20% drop in valuation from the first to the 15th unit. But so this idea that desensitization plays a role is really reflected in our data. Okay, so, so first I'm going to uh, discuss some, some uh, benchmark outcomes. So of course, an obvious benchmark outcome is the selfish competitive equilibrium, according to which people completely disregard the, the negative externality. In that case, they would trade five units in, uh, in single and 15 units in multi. So now we're also going to introduce this concept of a competitive equilibrium with moral costs. So what, what do we do here in words? And so we estimate the moral costs for each person. Uh, for units of 1.5 donations from uh, individual decision making, we, we estimate each person's moral costs and then construct uh, the competitive equilibrium 
by combining people's moral costs with the induced values and costs. And importantly, we, we correct people's uh, moral costs here by the average trend in the individual decision-making treatment, where we do see, like, like in, uh, like in uh, Bartling, Falk and Özdemir, that there is some decrease in, in, in over time. And we do correct for that here. But so, so what is the idea here? We randomly, uh, in, in this, in this uh, to co calculate the competitive equilibrium with moral costs, we do a simulation exercise where for each market, we first randomly select two people, one buyer and one seller. We give them the possibility to trade uh, the unit, looking at their estimated moral cost for that particular unit and see whether the gains of trade compensate their summed up moral cost. If, if it does, then they trade the unit. If it does not, then they don't trade the unit. But we, in, in either case, we then draw again two people, see if they want to trade or not. And we continue doing this until we cannot find anybody any longer who wants to trade with the counterpart of the other market side. Right, so th this is how we construct a competitive equilibrium with moral costs, which would essentially mean that people that we so we, 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 we include in the supply and the demand curve the moral costs of people. But other than that, you know, it's, it's constructed in the same way as a normal uh, selfish competitive equilibrium. So what we then do is we also use we calculate a competitive equilibrium under the counterfactual assumption that everybody is using homogeneous and constant moral costs equal to the median trader in their group. So here we're going to set everyone's ma uh, marginal costs equal to the median moral costs in the group for the first unit of that person. But right? so we're, we're going to counterfactually create homogeneous people here. And then we're going to do the same exercise. And we think that this is interesting because by comparing two and three, we identify the effect that market selection can have in this setup. So here you see uh, the results. So here first you see the homogeneous uh, marginal cost, co mar mar marginal uh, competitive, no, the, the homogeneous competitive, uh, moral competitive equilibria. And th these benchmarks should be the same across, across the three treatments. And, and you see that they are uh, approximately. Right? So according to this uh, benchmark, people should trade approximately 35% of the units in the market and then stop doing so. Here in red or red brown, we add what people would trade if we look at the actual heterogeneous, heterogeneous moral cost curves, right? And, and what that allows them to trade on top of the homogeneous benchmark. And you see that, that in particular in full, this allows them to trade quite a bit more. So now trade there increases from roughly 35% to 60%. And we use this uh, to these two benchmarks to compare what's actually happening in the experiment. What's actually happening in the experiment is in green. So in green, you see what's uh, uh, on the left-hand side, you see what's how mu much people trade in the single benchmark. And you see that already in single, already in single people, people, um, trade more, substantially more than according to this uh, heterogeneous competitive moral cost equilibrium, which means that already in single, we do observe that people, people's morals get eroded. If you compare multi and single, then on aggregate, there's not that much going on, which means that in our setup, these increased possibilities for social learning do not play much of a role, at least not at the aggregate level. What is, I think, very important and also very striking is that in the full treatment, where there's no capacity constraints, right? So here, 
the replacement excuse plays can, can play any role that it wants. Here, 99% of the units were traded on average, right? So almost all, all material gains were exploited here at the expense of UNICEF, right? And I think, so, so maybe if you look at this at the beginning, you think, oh, well, the jump from, from multi to full is not that much, but it actually is because what people do in multi and single is they trade but they don't trade the 20% last units. And those were the very selfish units that only, that only gave the, the pair of traders 20 euro cents while they cost uh, 1.50 to UNICEF. Right? So, so from a welfare perspective, trading these units is particularly costly. Um, differences between uh, differences between these treatments is not significant, and differences between these treatments and these treatments is very significant. So we see almost uh, we see partial erosion in single and multi. We see complete erosion in full. Okay, so now to now to uh, distinguish between uh, market selection and the replacement excuse, we look at who's trading, who's trading, who's being active at trading the least profitable units, right? So these are the units that only yield 20 cents to the couple. And what we see here is that, so in red are the people that have median costs above the median in the that have moral costs above the median in their group. And in gray are the people that have moral costs below the median in their group. And what should happen is that if, if it's only, if it's only, um, if it's only selection that plays a role, then these moral people, people should abstain from trading. And that's what they don't do, right? So, in the full market, in the full market, many, many people become active. And even the moral people, people with moral costs that are higher than the median in their group, start trading and they start becoming active almost to the similar extent as, as the less moral people. Right? So we, we conclude from this that a key force for uh, a key force for driving a complete erosion in full is uh, the, the replacement logic, right? So, so many people become active once we get rid of capacity constraints in the market. So here we look at the number of acceptances and offers at the least profitable units. And uh, this shows a somewhat similar picture, although here you see a slightly bigger effect of, uh, so here we see we, what we plot here is the normalized number of actions, right? So the normalized number of acceptances and offers at the least profitable units. And we normalize it because of, oh, sorry about that. We normalize it because in the single market, people uh, had, could, could trade only three times as little, right? So here we, we multiply the, the, the number of actions in single by three, and then we compare it to the others. What you see here is that in single and multi, people are not very active at, at, at these very unprofitable units. And that differs quite a bit from, uh, from uh, the full market, right? So the full market is the only market that, that really encourages people to become uh, very active, even at these very unprofitable units. Here you see the difference between uh, gray and red being a bit larger than in the previous slides, which means that 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 that, um, that market selection also plays some role, right? So it's not the case that that these people trade to the same extent. It is it is it is true that that uh, the the more people the people with this lower moral costs are, are somewhat more active than than the others. So we also looked at, uh, at whether people, people's market behavior, but it has, has consequences beyond the market. 
right? So remember that we elicit the people's individual pre preferences before the market and also after the market. And we thought, ex ante, we thought that, you know, the, even, even if markets deteriorate uh, morals, um, this will be temporary and, and not continue to happen uh, after the market. And this is not what we see. So here you see individual decision making and the single market in red. And in both, there is some decrease in how they value a 1.50 euro donation to UNICEF. And if you then look at the multi-unit market in green and the full market in orange, here the decrease is even stronger. In all these treat, in each of the four treatments, the decrease is significant, but the uh, decrease is strongest and significantly stronger in multi and full compared to uh, IDM. So we conclude that moral costs decrease over time in our setup, and the persistence of erosion of moral costs is even stronger in multi unit markets. So here we, sh I show you the beliefs that people had. At the end of the experiment, we asked them to report their beliefs about what people, about people's behavior on the individual decision-making part in part one. So before the market, and we asked them to predict the switching point of a person or how much people valued a donation of 1.50 to UNICEF. What we see here, here you see the four bars are the, the four treatments. In gray, you see the absolute uh, error, which means that, and it's approximately the same in each treatment, which, which means that helping them, uh, allowing them to trade in the market did not make them better forecasters about, or also not worse forecasters on average, uh, than what, uh, uh, about how people acted in the part one. What is more important is in red. So in, the, in red, you see the bias in people's uh, estimates. So in the individual decision-making treatment, people are slightly, not much, but slightly too optimistic about their fellow participants. In single, uh, they are no longer, but also not much too pessimistic, but in multi and particularly in full, People become way too pessimistic about the morality of, the, of their fellow traders. Right? So it seems as if these people cannot, cannot understand that the market per se is the one that really causes people to trade very actively. And you know that even people that are quite nice normally become very active and that you should not take that very seriously if you want to predict their behavior outside of the market. But so it leads to, to biased social views of other people. So multi-unit markets participants become too pessimistic about fellow traders' models. So finally, I want to say something about the norms that we elicited. So we asked the question, a la Krupka Weber, we asked the question, is it socially appropriate to cancel a donation of 1.5 euros when paid one euro in a market or individual decision making? So on the left hand side is individual decision making. On the right hand side is the market. And what you see here is that so one is very socially inappropriate, two is somewhat socially inappropriate, three is socially somewhat appropriate and four is very socially appropriate. And overall, people find it quite immoral to trade in this market and somewhat more so in individual decision-making than in markets, right? Which is maybe not so surprising, right? But the difference between individual decision-making and markets, although it's not super large, it is significant. What is, I think, a very striking takeaway from uh, these pictures is what's on the right hand side here, what's on the right hand side, is that the evidence for the markets, for the three markets, is, is actually quite similar. Right? So these people did not think that the full market trading was much more socially appropriate than in the other markets.
But still, this was what was happening, right? So it's not the case that people think uh, in the food market, it's okay to take. No, they don't think that. But still, you know, almost every unit, even that yield tiny profits, those get traded. So the finding that market outcomes are more selfish and full cannot be explained by, prevailing, by the prevailing social norm. So now I get to the conclusions. So markets with replacement logic let moral people act immorally. So in the full market, traders completely ignore their morals. Even unit yield yielding a surplus of only 20 cents are almost always traded at a cost of 1.50 to UNICEF. Right, so, so my takeaway from our study is that the original idea of the Falcon Sex study, even though it was criticized uh, in some follow-up work, I think the original idea is, is very true. You know, morals, morals are eroded in markets. And actually, the Falcon Sex paper even gives a big underestimation of the total effect. If you allow people to trade multiple units, as most people would be able in, in, in real world markets. And um, they find excuses which make them act as if there's no negative external effect at all. So what we found very striking was that the same people who act morally in individual decision-making forget about the morals and markets where the replacement logic is possible. So in full, only 9% of subjects have moral costs of at most 20 cents. While in the market, 83% of subjects engage in trading that allows a pair to share twins. Right, so, so this is, I think, super strong evidence for that the replacement um, logic really affects market results to a very large extent. And so, so sometimes when we run experiments, sometimes people criticize experiments for, yeah, it's, it's about peanuts and people were not really involved. People in our experiment were super involved. <clears throat> and many of them spontaneously wrote comments which uh, reflected how upset they were. So here I'm going to give you one, uh, oh, one, uh, one, one, one of the quotes. So one of the subjects complained, the level of selfishness displayed on market two has almost made me cry during the experiment. Today, my faith in humanity has taken a giant blow. Okay, I think this is uh, enough that I wanted to say. So thanks for your attention. Thank you so much, dear Theo. That was super interesting. Um, Thank you. So, uh, yeah, do we have questions? Uh, there was quite some questions in the, in the chat. Yeah. Um, but maybe we have also new questions. I have a question. Um, well, it's actually, it's, it's more of a comment that um, moral behavior seems to be very context specific. And my favorite example is say in Italy where I lived for two years in Florence. And the Italians I found to be extremely warm and friendly and wonderful people until they got into an automobile. And then the behavior was just totally different. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's the exact same individual, but they're in, a, in the same place in Florence, but a slightly different context and radically different behavior. Um, and the same happens, I think, in every country. It's just as the most dramatic to me. It certainly happens in the United States uh, and Germany, but it's the most dramatic in Italy, I thought. Yeah, yeah I, my, my impression about Italians is exactly the same. So I, I find driving in Italy very challenging. Uh, so, so thank you for the comment. I, I fully agree. So uh, I, I think that what we show is that, that markets deteriorate people's morals, but that doesn't mean that, that there's no other factors that also can affect morals. And I, I agree with you that it's sometimes maybe not a market, but a context that plays a big role. Yeah. So this is definitely not the only factor. I, I, I completely agree. 
I, I think a lot of traders would uh, agree with you that that the moral uh, compass within often you know many trading markets is you basically just it's ruthless. You just do whatever you can, mm -hmm. and that's the way it works. And they sort of tell themselves they have a story yeah. that that says by you know Adam Smith. Uh, by my being as greedy as possible, I am benefiting society. It's actually not so bad. You know? I, I, I fully agree. So, so you, but what you say is fully consistent with, with what we observe in our experiment. You know? yeah. But still, people are very upset about what's happening. You know, it's not, it's not that they feel good about it, not in our, at least not in our experiment. People are upset by, by the frantic trading in this market. And, and I think that happens with the traders too. That's why the traders tend to uh, earn a lot of money and then they quit their jobs at 33 or 35, you know, very early yeah. and do something else. And then they start to be nice people, right? Contributing yeah. to charities. Yeah. Yeah. Easing their conscience after, uh, after retiring. <laughs> this is interesting, no? That human, humans can are like this, you know, that, that we have this almost split personalities. I think that's mostly seen in these big billionaires that can really have some sort of cognitive dissonance and behave very ruthlessly in the markets mm -hmm. on which they are um, collecting the billions, all the while running charity programs on the side. Mm -hmm. And they somehow justify this to themselves quite easily. Mm -hmm. yeah. We have an interesting question in the chat also, and it's uh, would markets with longer history lead to more deterioration? So you say that again? Would market? A market with a longer history. With a longer history. Mm -hmm. If it would uh, cause more moral erosion. Uh, yeah, so we have... Um, a rather limited uh, history, right? So, so the, these periods take quite a long time. So in the end, we only had four market periods and there was not that much of a trend in those four periods. But uh, I think you can also not conclude too much from it because four periods is not a long history. Uh, so from our study, I cannot say so much about that. But it could be that, uh, yeah, I don't know whether in, in, with a long history, things become worse or not. But so, so this experiment already takes about two hours, you know, and then you only have four periods. Uh, so it would be super interesting to extend this, but it's also experimentally, it's quite challenging to extend it. So I don't know, I, I don't have a very good answer. But I simply, we don't have data. Yeah, I mean, we, we did not look into the multi-unit markets, obviously. I, I yeah. just remember that in our study, um, we, we had two uh, kind of evaluations. One was we just looked into the first offer. So without you having seen anything from the market yet, you just know you are part of a, a larger market mm -hmm. um, from the offers you would make for selling your mouse. Um, and we already saw that there is an effect. So even without any history in the market, people adapted already and more people were willing to um, sell their mouse by making the price offer. Um, but we also saw that uh, during the trading round, uh, uh, these, you know, the, the um, reservation values of, of the sellers came, came down. Yeah, so then, then obviously the trading history there had an impact. And also over time, there was a bit of an impact too. Mm -hmm. yeah, so it was so. From that, I, I could imagine that this has an impact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. You you had a longer history. Yeah, that's correct. So you're you're the better to answer this one. Um, I also have a question. Um, do you have specific kind of personalities who react differently? So I remember from our studies, there's. Um, some specific kind of people, some are people with a higher IQ <laughs> who are better at resisting these market forces. Do you see something uh, similar? So I remember that uh, Andreas uh, had made a table in the appendix, but I don't remember the details. Can, can you step in here, Andreas? Yeah, sure. So um, 
one limitation here is that we don't have much data. So we don't have IQ scores and we had some questionnaire measures. Um, we have some, you know, phrase which was supposed to sort of match the idea of replacement logic that has a strong agreement. But otherwise it's not, um, it wasn't that, you know, looking at this analysis, there was a clear type profile which we could identify. But I think that is mostly due to the new gender, age, and a, thing, a few things only. And uh, that doesn't help much, I think, in mm-hmm. yeah, drilling down in detail. Yeah, also, also in our full mark, there were not so many people that were, <laughs> there was almost no one that was very moral, right? Yeah. It's hard to identify the moral types. Than, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's true. You have basically everybody on board. Huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> in your setup, that makes a lot more sense, right? Because you have more like, uh, also quite a few people who don't trade, right? Yeah, yeah. I had asked that in the chat before, do you see regret? Do people express more regret, regret after fool? Yeah, so I don't, so I don't, we didn't have a question. So we do have some comments, some spontaneous comments, and I, 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 I'm not sure that regret played a bigger role there. Probably could be, but I think we don't have data to, to back this up. What do you th- say, Andreas? Yeah, it's very similar. So I think the data we have is basically, if you look at the distribution of comments between treatments, there's many more comments in full, which are you know, sort of a, I'm angry, disappointed, what is going on with the world type of comment uh, in full. But yeah, I mean, this is a bit stretching. However, maybe we can also point out that there's something that goes a bit in the opposite direction, which is uh, when we, after the market, run again individual Mm decision-making, we do find that people in full tend to exhibit more selfish behavior Mm -hmm. in the individual decision-making replica of what has happened at the start. So we could also see that there are tendencies in the direction of, if you want, expose rationalizing what has happened in the market and you know, some sort of like adapting of one's own individual preferences to those outcomes. Yeah, but I think that that, 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 that also reflects that people, or perhaps also reflects that people may have become a bit frustrated, right? And, and that, that, you know, that that's, if others don't do it, then uh, I'm also not going to do it, right? People became way too pessimistic about their fellow traders in that market. And I think that that also, so, so I think we, we have one also interesting correlational evidence that people that became most pessimistic in their beliefs, that those were the people that, uh, that went down in part three in the individual decision-making value the most. Right. So, so this is correlational, of course, but it seems that, that some of the very disappointed people then also adapted their own behavior in the direction of what they thought the others were doing. Well, th- thank you so, so much. Um, um, we, we agreed before that uh, maybe we can discuss a few minutes more if, if Theo and co-authors have the time, but of course we also need to end on time for those who need to um, hop on uh, to, to some other meetings. Uh, so thank you everybody so much for coming. Um, in two weeks, we will have uh, René Bon presenting and um, have a lovely afternoon. And let me thank already now Theo and co authors for this amazing study. Um, and yeah, uh, those who want to stay, um, let's discuss some minutes more, but for those who need to move on, have, have a good afternoon. Yeah, thank you for allowing us to present. I mean, it's it's a super, super interesting study and I think it's so natural, uh, you know? I mean, it's super artificial to say you can only trade one item, right? I mean, there's many cases where you can trade much more. So I I find this such an important, uh, (laughs) such an important study. It feels so natural to me. Yeah. Um, but I mean, this this effect that I say, I expect that in full, everybody's morals are super eroded. I mean, it's difficult to say, right? Is it really my expectation or is it a kind of justification, right? Ex- exposed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I, I think it's it's uh, eroded in the sense that we, we have this um, moral competitive equilibrium benchmark. And this shows how much people could trade 
if they if they uh, if if their morals didn't change, if the if the market doesn't affect their the, the preferences, and what we do see. So also, what what is I think very interesting is that if only replacement logic plays a role to the extent that people start trading like the most immoral person in the group, we would still not have seen an increase in volume in trading in full. Right, so then we would only have seen that, that the identity of people would have swapped. But right? so, so, so <clears throat> what I find very interesting is that is that people, not only everybody started trading, but also you know everybody started trading much more than could be rationalized on the basis of the least moral person in, in their group. Right? So th it is as if people have these fulfilling self-fulfilling expectations you know that they it's it's like a stack hunt game and they end up coordinating on the bad equilibrium um and yeah given that everybody but everybody else is doing it then you might as well follow yeah it's interesting and uh, even though the norm seems to stay quite okay-ish right i mean yeah yeah, and that leads to frustration, right? That people have this norm that, that it's not so okay to trade, but then everybody is seduced to trading to the max. So in that sense, I think the, 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 the full market was quite uh, frustrating for our subjects. Yeah. And maybe people learned something about themselves that they were not that happy about. <laughs>